no conscience either. Just before dawn on November the 26th, 1983, a gang committed the biggest armed robbery in the history of crime. Their target was the Brinksmat warehouse near Heathrow Airport. The security firm thought the building was bandit proof. They hadn't reckoned on one of their own guards simply opening the door. This, according to the guards, is what happened next. The robbers forced them to reveal how the high security vault could be unlocked. Otherwise, they'd burn them alive. The robbers on that team aren't nice people. Some armed robbers, some professional criminals, can be charismatic and interesting people, and it would be wrong to deny it. It would be just as wrong to deny that they're people who are quite prepared to put both barrels of a sawn off through you if you stand between them and the prize. When they got that vault open, to them, as professional criminals, as professional robbers, it must have been the happiest day of their lives. They thought they'd gone in for two million pounds. What they saw was 13 times that. The biggest lump of gold they'd ever have seen in their lives. So it would be paradise. It'd be Aladdin's cave. It's any term like that you want to think of, but it's the peak of their careers. It's one of the biggest ever armed robberies in world history. I think the previous largest figure related to the war and to priceless works of art being stolen by fleeing Nazis at the end of the war. So the parallels aren't really there. They are very, very hard people. Otherwise, how could they have the capacity to carry guns? And yet you do get the ironies of a moment occur as, as they left that building, as they got into their van to drive away with their 26 million pounds. One of them turned to the trussed up guards and called at that time of year. Merry Christmas, lads. By the time the police arrived, the gang were gone. Their inside man had switched off the alarm system. As the morning wore on, the scale of what had been taken from the Brinksmat warehouse began to dawn. A criminal gold reserve of 26 million pounds bigger than that of many small countries. It had been acquired by organization, brute force, and criminal cunning. They were certainly clever people, and we mustn't underestimate them, and I certainly don't. I believe they knew they were, they were going to get a large amount of gold, and certainly from the inquiries that, that I've made, they were soon able to deal with that gold. So, yes, they were well organised. I do believe they expected a large amount of gold. Whether they expected quite the amount they got, I couldn't say. The police concentrated their search in South London. They got an early lead. The treacherous Brinksmat guard had a sister, and she lived with one of the robbers. He and an accomplice were arrested. Other members of the gang melted into the underworld shadows. The gold had been bought by the Johnson Mathey Bank. They were planning to ship it from Heathrow to Hong Kong on behalf of a Middle Eastern client. The client still wanted his gold. Lloyd's insurance had to pay out the money to replace the missing 6,800 bars. The scale of the robbery sent a shudder through the mechanism which governs the price of gold. The price went up. Within two days, the gang had made a paper profit of more than a million pounds on their ill-gotten investment. They were in no hurry to cash in. The hot Johnson Mathy gold was left to cool. Guarded by a single watchman, it was hidden in a secret location somewhere in London. Where did the gold go when it left Heathrow? Well, I think a lot of people would like to know. 
It was probably laid down for a few days. They would have expected some gold, they didn't expect that much. But as professionals, whilst they weren't set up and waiting for that big pull, they did know that they had many, many places, garages, lockups scattered around South London, going out into Kent and even down into Sussex where it could be buried. And that gold would have been laid down for at least a few days whilst they waited to see how intense police activity was. Gold bars, like the paper money whose value they support, carry their own serial numbers. That identity had to be erased. The men responsible for this initial smelting were never traced. Once anonymous, the bars could be sold. The robbers knew of a likely customer. Earlier, he'd organized a similar exercise in criminal alchemy, making gold ingots out of smuggled gold coins. The enterprise had netted him five million pounds and a reputation as a reliable fence of stolen gold. His name, Kenneth James Noy. Kenneth Noy obviously has a very good track record as a businessman and a businessman who's not too worried about how he does business. He's obviously successful, he's clever, he's a good wheeler dealer, he's a cool man, he's a good operator. And obviously, there were people who thought he could be trusted to oversee the complexity of moving gold through the illicit chains back into the legitimate market for cash. Noy lived at Hollywood Cottage in Kent, stockbroker stolid on the outside with interiors of ostentatious wealth. Brenda Noy says her husband never touched the stolen gold. He was rich enough not to need to get his hands dirty. He's had money for years. It's ridiculous to say that he's only just got it since the Brinks man. He's a very clever businessman. He enjoys doing business deals. But the actual doing the deal was, I think, what he got most of the kick out of. He's his own person. He's not, he's not a mastermind. He's not some big gangster. He's not a... He's not, he's not the things that they're making him out to be. He's, he's worked hard for what he's got. They're, they're, they've, they've made him into something, some big crook, some big time man. And he isn't he's any of these things. He just isn't. He's, he's just a normal family man who is a workaholic, and he enjoys making money. If something comes along cheap, then, he, then he's bought it, like the majority of the public would do. These, uh, in a way, are uh, kind of conventional criminals. They're all sort of well over 30, most of them. Um, they've been around a long time. They're working class guys who've made good through crime, if you like, or got rich through crime. But they're still very much in the working class mold. Uh, they've moved into business, but in a kind of, like a successful, say, builder would, uh, who's come off the floor, really, and, and builds up a bit of a business, but not sophisticated. They, they still don't send their children to private schools. Before he could sell the stolen gold, Noy needed a cover. He went to a bank in Jersey to buy legitimate bullion and just as valuable to get official receipts for it. Having bought that gold, he put it in a carrier bag, which they had to give him, and he walked down to the bank carrying a hundred thousand pounds worth of gold when the deal was finished, under his arm, and disappeared out onto the street. He went round the corner, opened another bank account, got himself a deposit box, and put those gold bars there. Then he flew back to, to, to London that same day. That was a style of life that Kenneth Noy w w would carry out. Noy recruited this man, Brian Reader, to distribute and sell on the stolen Brinksmat gold. Police knew that Reader made regular visits to Noy's house. They'd been watching Hollywood Cottage because they'd become suspicious of Noy's gold runs to Jersey. It was too soon, though, to prove a connection with the stolen gold. The handovers were made in consignments of 11 bars at a time. The police were watching, but stayed their hand. They wanted to follow Reader to see where the gold trail would lead. Gold is no good to robbers. What they want is money. So as soon as that gold could be turned into a much more acceptable commodity, that is money, then they could put it to use. This robbery's been a watershed, I think, for London armed robbers because the 
vast amount of money has been more than they've ever known how to handle. In the past, on an armed robbery, you might get as your share 10, 20, 40, 50, 100,000 pounds from a really big one. And that could be um, lost at the gaming clubs, it could be lost or spent in all sorts of ways on high living. When your share of a robbery might be two, three, four million pounds, then for these traditionally working class robbers, then it's quite a shock and they found themselves having to get into bed with another class of criminal. This hotel was one of seven pickup points where Reader handed over the gold to a network of couriers. He had to get the gold out of London. The ingots traveled west. Although the gold had lost its markings, it was still pure 24 karat bullion, too risky to sell. Reader needed somewhere out of the way where it could be transformed into cheaper, coarser gold scrap. He chose the bullion dealers Scadlins in Bedminster, a suburb of Bristol. Scadlins advertised throughout Britain for the right sort of base metals to melt with the Brinksmat bars so that their priceless identity could be debased and disguised. Somewhere along the line, that gold had to be turned into money. It had to get into the legitimate gold market, and that was the function of Scadlins. And that was probably the weakness that brought the whole operation down, because the people involved in Scadlins were simply out of their league. The gold was taken to a country house not far away, the home of a local jeweller and a former director of Scadlins. In the grounds, screened by trees, there was a small iron hut with a smelter in it. John Palmer was the unsuspecting jeweller, whose job it was to change again the identity of the gold for Scadlins. About half the haul, 13 million pounds worth, was melted down in the hut. Copper coins were dropped into the crucible. Scadlins hoped that the resulting alloy would pass as innocent jeweller's scrap. Scadlins were over-optimistic. It was an absurdly large amount of scrap gold. Suspicions were soon aroused. Gold is a unique commodity. 90% of all the gold ever mined is still in circulation. Gold market experts know where most of it is at any one time. They certainly notice when vast lumps of it, however camouflaged, blunder in and out of the market. Whatever the suspicions, legitimate bullion dealers did buy the crude ingots forged in John Palmer's shed. One customer was Johnson Mathy. It paid the market rate for what, unknown to the bank, was its own adulterated property. The sale of these rough bars had a startling effect on Scadlin's cash flow. A tidal wave of money, much of it from the sale of the gold back to Johnson Mathey, surged through this branch of Barclays, the bank Scadlin's used. No one seemed to notice. No one thought it strange when Scadlin's decided to withdraw half a million pounds in 50 pound notes and were happy for it to be taken away in a dustbin liner. What went on at that Barclays branch in Bedminster in Bristol really beggars belief. You have a little bank in a very poor area of Bristol, and in four months they pour through their doors ten and a half million pounds in cash to the people from Scadlins. And it's a very questionable operation that went on there, I think, because the turnover, the accounts of Scadlins, had not been in particularly large figures before. This sudden tide of money just washes through. And you wonder why their suspicions really weren't aroused a lot earlier, because at one stage we had somebody from Scadlins saying to a bank clerk in that Bedminster branch, oh, we may, be we may soon be needing a million pounds a day in cash. And when you look at the way the Scadlin people handled that money, the rest of us, when we go into the bank, we count the money we draw out. We count the money we put in. We want receipts for it. Money matters to us. This had just got out, out of control. It wasn't fixed figures, fixed quantities of money. It was lumps of money. And as the bank clerks testified later, people from Scadlins would go into one of the branches where they were paying in as well as taking out, take in £50,000 and say, count that uh, and leave without the receipt. Now, who would do that? if they were running a legitimate business. Eventually, bank employees did raise the matter with head office, 
But still, Barclays didn't call the police. Certainly, it was something that concerned me. At first, I couldn't understand uh, why a bank manager or a bank uh, would hand out millions of pounds over the counter in cash and not be suspicious. Certainly, I now understand that banks are constrained by their relationship with their client and the Bankers Act. However, I'm sure it is a matter for concern. On another occasion, Garth Chappell, the director of Scadlin's, asked to withdraw a quarter of a million pounds in 50 pound notes. No one raised an eyebrow as he stacked the bundles in a cardboard box, carrying a fortune out of the bank as if it were so many groceries from the corner shop. The role of the banks is very questionable. Could they not see that a company as small as Scadlin's had to be looked at when it was handling so much, when it had to be in cash? Why couldn't it be legitimate transactions going all the way through paper exchanges of money, as most money does move around? From my information, uh, American banks have a $10,000 limit. Uh, that means that if someone goes into an American bank and puts more than $10,000 in cash on the counter, there is a record of that. And I believe the Federal Reserve Bank uh, get that record. Certainly, from a police point of view, a similar law or regulation in this country would assist the police. However, that is a matter for the Home Office and politics, not the police. Noy used another bank in Croydon to look after the cash that came back from Bristol. The bank unwittingly allowed him to use a false name to transfer one and a half million pounds to Dublin. I think it veers on criminality. <coughs> I think that uh, if a bank manager uh, telexes money on behalf of a man who he has not bothered to identify, then he's in grave danger of uh, handling stolen money. And I think his public duty is to ensure that if he does telex money abroad, that the very least he has is a proper contact address for his client. Noy used other false names when transferring money abroad. Altogether, he moved three and a half million pounds to bank accounts in Dublin and Switzerland after depositing briefcases full of money. It was always 50 pound notes, always new ones. It took hours just to count it. I know when my husband done any dealings, he insisted on new 50 pound notes in sealed bags. Um, because there was a lot of forgeries about and he didn't want to end up with any of those. That was the, the main reason and that they're easier to handle. Kenneth Noy epitomises a new kind of criminal. If he wasn't wheeling and dealing on the building sites, with the jewellers, with lumps of gold, he'd be in the city because he is the criminal yuppie. He'd be the inside dealer. The police were still watching Noy's house. Under cover of night, risking Noy's guard dogs which patrolled the grounds, two officers hid in the shrubbery. John Fordham and Neil Murphy were dressed in SAS-style uniform as they kept vigil. Unexpectedly, Brian Reader, the main courier, made another call at Hollywood Cottage. Aroused by his arrival or by the scent of strangers, the dogs grew restless. Fordham stayed in the bushes while his colleague withdrew. He tried in vain to pacify the dogs. Noy heard the commotion. He came out with a knife. In the struggle that followed, Noy stabbed the policeman nine times. John Fordham died later of his wounds. Well, he was, he, he was fighting for his life. He, he wasn't fighting for his gold. I mean, I was in the house as well. He was fighting for me. That, that was the only thing that was in his mind, I can assure you. He wasn't concerned about his gold. It was certainly a turning point for me. After he died, I and all those officers with me were determined to follow this thing through to the end, so that all those concerned in this crime are brought before the courts. Before dawn the next day, in the West Country, two people were to witness that new police determination. 
Farmer Fred Cullimore and his son George were on their way to pick up a friend. There is a nationwide police investigation following the death of Detective Constable John Fordham inside the grounds of a large mansion in Kent. The inquiries involve members of the Metropolitan Police Robbery Squad, C-11, which is trying to find out what happened to the gold stolen from the Brinksmat warehouse at Heathrow. It is understood this morning that the police investigations are going on in the West Country, as well as in London. The Cullimores were due to meet their friend outside the house of the jeweller, John Palmer. The house was aptly named. The Cullimores had wandered innocently into an extraordinary police operation. And when we got down to the coach house, this van went out straight across in front of us pretty rapidly. And the man got out and told us to shut the engine off and the lights out and be pretty quiet. That particular time, when my son reckoned he'd seen a, a police vehicle go down on one end of the traffic. And he thought it was a police raid, you see. And I said, don't be so silly, like. <laughs> But they are obviously, in the end, it proved that he was right. I thought it was very, very frightening. My son enjoyed it immensely, I must admit, and I tried to tell him it was pretty serious, because obviously every one of those guns was loaded, and uh, we were right in the middle of it, without any warning. When, when we came up the road, it was we were in one world, and the, when we got there, we were in a completely different fantasy world, as far as I could see. <laughs> The original robbery was carried out by armed and very violent men. I therefore had to conclude that those that were assisting them would also possibly be armed and extremely violent. And in order to protect those officers, we had to take the precautions that we did. Police circled the mansion and blocked off all the exits. They knew that Palmer was associated with Scadlins and suspected his part in the gold chain. But Palmer wasn't there. The police began a thorough search of the house and the grounds for evidence of a link. Palmer seemed to be implicated when two gold bars were found on the premises. Weightier evidence called for heavy lifting equipment. Scouring the grounds, the police had soon discovered the corrugated iron shed in the scrub and inside the smelter. It was still warm. Two men found hiding nearby admitted they'd been working at the smelter that night. Towards dusk, the furnace was taken off for forensic analysis. As night fell, a police convoy raced to the airport nearby. Their quarry had left the country. By pure coincidence, Palmer had taken off for the Canary Islands on a family holiday three days earlier. Alerted by the skirmish at battlefields, the press descended on Tenerife. Everyone wanted to talk to the man the tabloids dubbed Goldfinger. John Palmer gave an exclusive to BBC News reporter Kate Adey. John Palmer is a jeweller and bullion dealer. With his name very much in the news, his home raided by police, its grounds searched, and several of his friends and colleagues being questioned, it might have been thought that he would, in a way, have gone to ground in Tenerife. Not at all. Amongst all the holiday makers, he was to be found with his family and several friends intent on pursuing his holiday and giving his views on the events of the past few days. I simply had a message, uh, urgent matches to ring home. I uh, rang home and uh, I was simply to told the police had uh, smashed into my house, uh, and arrested the people that were looking after the house. Uh, that was the, the message I had. I was a completely uh, astonished uh, and amazed. Did you know or could you think of any reason for this happening? Uh, at first I couldn't think of any reason. I, I was amazed and then they told me it was connected with some uh, uh, bullion robbery and uh, the murder of a policeman and um, I was just amazed. Back in Britain, the two Heathrow robbers the police had caught earlier were brought to justice. 
you're listening to today on Radio 4 with Don Timpson and Brian Rota. Time now 22 minutes to 7. Two men who were part of the gang which robbed the Brinksmat warehouse of gold have each been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Brian Robinson and Michael McAvoy were convicted on the evidence of one of the Brinksmat guards, Anthony Black, who turned Queen's evidence and was given six years. To ensure his safety, police say Black will be detained at a secret location. The two ringleaders of the Brinksmat robbery were taken off to prison. Within hours of their conviction, the underworld whisper was of £50,000 for anyone who could spring them from jail. Black, the traitor guard at Brinksmat, had betrayed the very people he'd conspired with. Sentenced to six years, he's since been released. The underworld has put a price on him too, this time on his life. With at least some of the robbers accounted for, the police turned to the Golden Chain Gang, the men who distributed the stolen bullion. Noy stood trial for the murder of the policeman at his home. He pleaded self-defence, that an intruder in SAS uniform could have been anyone, even a gangland rival. The jury accepted his plea. But his role as receiver of the Brinksmat gold was proved at a second trial. The jury heard that the police had traced at least half of the original haul, 13 million pounds worth, through the coffers of Scadlins. To this day, no one knows where the other half went. Noy received 14 years for handling the stolen gold and another two years for failing to pay a fine. He couldn't have paid. The police had seized and frozen all his assets. Brian Reeder, the man who moved the gold west to Scadlins, was sentenced to nine years. Garth Chapel, the Scadlins co-director with the cardboard box and John Palmer's friend, got ten. Palmer himself was still on extended holiday in Tenerife. After sending his family back to England, he invested in a timeshare property business in the island. He put £150,000 into this development, close to the resort where he'd originally booked his holiday. He had to do something. Palmer was bored. Even the island's nightlife and the incessant sangria began to pall, though friends flew out to keep him company in exile. In the end, though, time ran out for Palmer, or rather, it ran out for Palmer's passport. He'd forgotten to check the expiry date, so 18 months after he'd begun his holiday, Palmer was ordered off the island. He flew to Rio de Janeiro, but the Brazilian authorities too were concerned that he didn't have a valid passport and put him on a flight back to London. Once back in Britain, John Palmer was taken to Scotland Yard. The police who had raided battlefields were able at last to meet its owner face to face. At his Old Bailey trial, John Palmer said Scadlins had used him. He hadn't known the bars were part of the Brinksmat Hall. The cost for him had already been high. Jail while he was awaiting trial and his assets frozen by the police. The jury agreed he had simply been doing what he thought was a legitimate job for Scadlins and acquitted him. As for the gold robbers, the police were still searching for 12 members of the original gang, the men who'd set off the whole cycle of selling, smelting, reselling, resmelting and selling again. The two jailed robbers refused to tell where the gold had been stored or the names of their accomplices. And no one in London's underworld would provide information about the men at large. Speculation, though, continues. If you want to meet the men who carried out the Brinksmat robbery, you've only got to go to certain pubs or clubs in South London. They're around. There are, well, we have two men in prison serving very long sentences and two men who are on their toes. They do fear that the police have enough evidence to arrest them if they can get to them. But there's at least five of them you could find in certain pubs in the Southwark, in the South London Dockland area, who are well known to the people in that neighbourhood. They're known for what they've always done. They've always been major armed robbers. They still are. And people know who was on that job because some people have got a lot of money. The police can't find enough evidence to arrest them. The police have a list of suspects, crooks who had earlier worked a VAT fiddle, importing zero-rated gold coins, melting them down into bullion, which does attract VAT, and skimming off the 15% profit. 
When, when they were originally smuggling gold and bilking the, the exchequer out of his 15% VAT, they were in fact going over to Switzerland with bags of money in their hands because they didn't know about bankers' drafts. But that was quickly corrected and they learned, and they learned that you can sh shunt money around the world very easily. And there were always solicitors and financiers who were prepared to do it. Indeed, they, they, they found bullion markets in London uh, where people were prepared to buy gold and discreetly look the other way, as it were, on the um, VAT certificate. The robbers had an unusual problem, an embarrassment of cash. But they had an unusual ally, the law. A law which, since 1979, lets anyone take money abroad with very few questions asked. Money makes you more sophisticated because just to handle your money and use it, you inevitably have to draw on professional services. And as we know, professional services are fairly expedient in their morality. I mean, we see that in the city all the time. And if you've got two or three million pounds to play with, you will always find people who will advise you and help you to keep it secure and invest it, let's say, in Switzerland to ensure that you can go over to Switzerland every three or four months and just draw out your interest and that kind of thing. Now, that's why sequestration of these people is very, very difficult. Um, I mean, they've learned to put their money into offshore companies, as you, as you know, and to use small marginal banks. Um, and it's very difficult to track down this money. But it's very funny that with the, with the bullion gold, um, they in fact built, the, they not only stole it, but they then sold it on the market and in fact um, built the taxpayer of the VAT. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a double event and people have sort of forgotten this in, in, in all the furore that's gone on about the um, 83 gold robbery. For the proceeds of the Brinks Matt Gold, the robbers chose two offshore islands which share the same relaxed, discreet and hospitable attitude to money. The Isle of Man was one. On the other side of the Atlantic, the British dependency of Tortola was the second. The islands and the ocean between them were a sort of global rinse cycle for the stubborn stains of the tainted Brinks Matt money. Like the gold bars, the money had to lose its identity. Travelling from the Isle of Man to the Caribbean, then invested in the United States, with its profits repatriated to Britain, the money shed its criminal fingerprints. Patrick Diamond is a solicitor on the Isle of Man. He was one of the robbers' links between the two islands. Using an office in Douglas, he drew up more than a hundred front companies. These companies had one main function, to acquire bank accounts. One letterhead from each company was enough to satisfy bank managers. So the Brinks Matt loot, exhausted by seizure, smelting and sale, at last had somewhere to draw breath. But soon it was on its travels again. To Tortola. One of the footprints of empire, the island has kept a stubborn toehold in the world of money as a paradise tax haven. For Britain and her historical dependencies are united in a commonwealth of banking without frontiers. Tortola's cash crop is cash, and it shares with the Isle of Man a Caribbean attitude to the question of where it comes from. With no check on the credentials of their clients, billions swill in the bank accounts of both islands. Crime itself couldn't have devised a more convenient way of banking its profits. The robbers used the system to reinvest eight and a half million pounds they received from the melting down of half the Brinksmat gold. In this office on Tortola, an accountant was their link. According to police, seven million pounds was invested in London property deals, while a drug syndicate based in Florida received a further one and a half million of Brinksmat cash. The money from Brinksmat has by and large joined with the other vast quantities of illegal money going out of this country. That other money is coming from cocaine and heroin. Millions and millions of pounds. The drug syndicate was based here in Miami. For them, using British banks was essential. American banking law is much tighter. Some bank managers have been caught and prosecuted for laundering money. The American Internal Revenue Service has been investigating the trail of the Brinksmat millions with Scotland Yard, but the British way of banking makes it hard going. We have very few uh, treaties 
or even our, even, uh, when I say treaties, mutual assistance treaties, or even our tax treaties. Very few of those treaties provide for um, comprehensive uh, disclosure of information from uh, countries uh, offshore. Uh, therefore, it makes it very, very difficult for us to trace the, the trail of those monies from the United States to an offshore location uh, through different bank accounts, corporations, etc. The Americans say it all went wrong in 1979. While they were bringing in tighter money controls, the British abolished currency restrictions. So the banking scandals uncovered in America could soon be a feature of British financial life. In many instances, you have to have collusion on the part of uh, bank officers uh, in the hierarchy in the bank to allow the sums of monies that we're talking about to be deposited, placed on deposit, uh, and these individuals, you know, have to have knowledge of the source of those monies. Uh, the monies are, are too voluminous in nature for an individual not to know that they're from an illegal source. Offshore British bankers aren't actually breaking the law, it's just that there isn't much banking law to break. The Americans say that a system which allows unaccountable and unaccounted criminal millions to sluice freely through legitimate banks is inviting crime. They need to uh, take a look at the, the program that's been established uh, by the United States since 1979 and the investigations that we've conducted and realize that uh, they have to uh, make a quick turn and uh, ensure that information is disclosed to the authorities in terms of identifying depositors, identifying names of bank accounts, identifying situation where your large sums of money are being deposited. South Florida is the gateway of the American drugs traffic. Miami and Fort Lauderdale have a billion dollar trade with Colombia where the drugs are grown. Everything conspires to make the traffic easy. America's appetite for drugs, Colombia's poverty, unpoliced bank accounts, and a coastline whose very size defies policing. And there are boats, lots of them. There are as many boats as cars in South Florida. The drug syndicate smuggled half a ton of marijuana and cocaine into Fort Lauderdale. According to the American Drugs Enforcement Agency, drugs profits easily quadruple in a year. The one and a half million soon became seven million pounds. No amount of vigilance by the United States customs agents in their powerboat Blue Thunder can search enough boats to check the racket. Since the discovery of a drug syndicate financed by the Brinksmap Cash, customs checks have been stepped up. It's just an hour by powerboat from the Caribbean, a day by yacht. Ahoy on the impromptu. Are you heading into Pier 66, Skipper? 10-4, go ahead and secure your vessel, then we'd like to talk to you. United States Customs. Okay. And, uh... What's underneath that? Okie dokie. Let me just poke my head down here. Okay. Can I take this out? You want to put this back down? Yeah, that's fine. Want to flash your life? The Florida Syndicate brought in its narcotic cargo along Fort Lauderdale's New River. We're coming up right now on a marina called the Annapolis Yacht Center which is just to my right and ahead of the boat. The Annapolis Yacht Center here with this wall that's right just inside to the left has been the site of a large drug smuggling operation which was just recently cracked by our offices and offices of the Drug Enforcement Administration where the very pier that we're going past on our left now was the location where many tons of narcotics were offloaded from smuggling vessels coming in. When they were caught, the syndicate leaders admitted they were the end of a line which stretched from the Brinksmat warehouse through the offshore islands and onto the streets of Miami. But although the police had cracked the syndicate, their profits were intact, invested and powerful. In Miami, a street dealer is found bleeding in the gutter after a gang vendetta. It may be happening half a world away, but for Brian Boyce, that's already dangerously close to home. I'm extremely worried that such an amount of money that is in circulation as a result of this crime is being, in my view, used for the purchase of drugs in America 
for use in this country. It appalls me because we all know what drugs do to our society and we can see from looking over the other side of the Atlantic what is likely to happen here if we aren't able to control the menace of drugs and that means controlling the people who are buying and supplying it not just the street traffickers. Brian Boyce knows that crime and the consequences of crime, whether it be a comatose junkie or a gangland victim, can cross the ocean just as easily as the money that underwrites it. Dirty money, however much you launder it, can only circulate in the squalid economies of crime. And crime, like money, is international. It's Miami tonight, but from the air, all cities look depressingly alike, wide open to the criminal entrepreneur. In Florida, the police are left to sweep up what scattered stragglers of the drugs network they can find. Spread your legs. Spread your legs. Gold into money, money into drugs, drugs into money. The cycle has increased the Brinks Mat money fourfold. Today's catch represents about 100 millionth of it. Some of the rest has come home through the same obliging system of bank accounts to finance the British cocaine habit. The trade generates its own internal economy. We've got to worry about that money when it comes back into Britain, when it's been cleaned up, it's gone through however many front companies, it appears to be legitimate, proper sources of capital investment coming into this country, because it's undermining what we might call legitimate capital, legitimate business, clean businessmen. Clean businessmen can't compete with dirty money because it's cheap. It didn't cost the robbers anything to get it. And so they can buy their way into business much more cheaply, they can have much wider margins than the legitimate businessman who may be arguing with his bank every day over the size of his overdraft. The big robbers, the big drugs dealers, the big major criminals who are here and who are happy don't have those problems. Business is good for them. The £7 million that's been invested into London property is now reckoned by police to be worth £21 million. It proves how crime can be made to pay and pay again through the sheer simplicity of loose money laws. The man in charge of the police campaign to bring about tougher legislation is the Assistant Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, John Dello. I think that it's necessary that we all appreciate the potential dangers here. If one allows the balance between good and bad money in any economy to get out of kilter, then clearly it affects society as a whole. Now, criminal money certainly is achieving such proportions here as to put up warning signals and I would have thought that if we fail to take action and we don't deal with this properly we could see ourselves in a business where at a time when legitimate business is fighting for its life against criminal money uh, they speak and this might be a apocryphal story so um, I'm not sure but I'm willing to believe when I'm told that um, criminal money is producing something like a millionaire a day in Miami uh, one can see the massive amounts of money that um, there is and it taints practically everything that it touches and one begins to see some danger to democratic government uh, and so on in some parts of the world. The Brinks Mat gold has caused the death of a policeman, ruined countless lives each side of the Atlantic and resulted in prison sentences for eight men. As well as continuing the search for the 12 original robbers, the police are now concentrating their inquiries on the business community in London. Further charges are likely. They're also watching for any signs of the emergence on the gold market of the other 13 million pounds worth of stolen gold. A criminal treasure that can't be left buried indefinitely. The only question is when it will resurface and what further mischief and scandal it has yet to cause.